This is a high-speed, four-track, high-iron videotape. But consider for a moment or two that the New York Central had ten times as many little steam engines as all the Mohawks, Hudson's, and Niagara's put together. Here we go on a rickety single track, 72 miles, Helena, New York, to Ottawa, Ontario, daily, three hours. This is typical of the tangled skein of single track, once conceived as one of the many funnels for the freights that barrel down the money-making main of the water level route. By the time this picture was taken, these money-losing branch lines had become tentacles that drained away the strength of the giants of Class I railroading. Caught in their tightening coils, management fought ferociously to abandon such trackage. But where so much as a single industry remained to be served, an array of legislators, municipal, county, state, even federal, blocked the railroads every step toward abandonment. Almost every time, the odd assortment of cars collected along the branches hit a junction. They had to be sorted. Aluminum ingot, on its way from the smelter at Messina, New York, to the rolling mill in Pittsburgh, had to be uncoupled from cars headed for other points and resorted at least five times. At small junctions, this rearrangement was an intricate dance of push and pull on the level. At big junctions, the cars could be pushed over a hump and sorted through dozens of switches into outgoing trains.
the New York Central may have been among the last railroads to acquire 484s, or northern-type locomotives in North America. But it was the first railroad anywhere to put four wheels under a firebox for freight and passenger service. In 1924, Lima first demonstrated the advantages of a four-wheel trailing truck. It permitted a much bigger firebox. Lima's first 284s, called Berkshires, were built for the Central Zone, Boston, and Albany. Their increased steaming capacity made a lasting impression on the Central. By 1925, the total number of miles run by the average passenger train on the New York Central had jumped 25% in just five years. Miles run by Pullman cars had grown 33%. Coach passenger traffic was up only 3%. Pullman cars were heavy. Lounge, dining, and sometimes observation cars were added, making trains even heavier. Greater power was needed to start these loads to accelerate them, to run them at increasingly higher speeds, and to keep them at speed for much longer distances. The Pacifics then in use could handle a maximum of 12 cars. Long distance passenger growth was dictating trains of as many as 18 Pullmans. The answer was the 464, America's first Hudson-type locomotive. Actually, the 464-type wheel arrangement was under consideration by a number of different railroads at this time. Had the necessary funds been available, probably the Milwaukee would have been the first to order a Hudson. The actual construction of the New York Central's first Hudson, number 5200, required only a few days. The boiler was received at Alco's Schenectady shops on January 28, 1927. The main frames and cylinders, February 2nd. The locomotive was steamed and painted February 8th. By early 1932, 205 of these locomotives were in service. It's been many years since the passenger train stopped at Altamont, Indiana, but it typifies the countless similar coal and water oases that dotted the New York Central system and were still in active service until the end of steam in 1958. Coal and water were served up differently on the main. There, at speeds approaching 80 miles an hour, the firemen could lower a scoop between the rails and force 40,000 gallons of water into his tender in a few seconds. Giant coal docks stood astride the four-track main in Wayneport, New York. In seconds, they could dump enough coal to keep the engine in motion from Buffalo to either New York or Chicago. <laughs> Because of her reluctance to go to four coupled axles on a main line so flat, management 
kept improving, Hudson. The J3, or Super Hudson, had higher steam pressure, slightly smaller cylinders, conical boilers, plus roller bearings on all wheels, both engine and tender, box pock drivers, and a combustion chamber. Combustion chambers had been eliminated from all the first Hudsons because of design difficulties. The J3, or Super Hudson, got much of its oomph from its reintroduction. A combustion chamber is nothing more than a space ahead of the firebox that permits the gases to continue burning for a longer period. The idea was not new. With the exception of the J1 and J2 Hudsons, virtually every locomotive built for the Central in the preceding 20 years had featured a combustion chamber. They made it necessary to shorten the boiler tubes, but the rate of heat exchange was increased enormously. To accommodate this feature, the J3 had the first tapered boiler on a Hudson. Initially, boiler pressure was increased from 225 to 275 pounds. This was so high that the side rods actually bent under some starting loads. Boiler pressure had to be reduced to 265 pounds. This was a favorite curve for publicity photos of new equipment. Breakneck tunnel was just to the left. Equipment could be back through the tunnel for motion shots. Can you imagine having this whole hundred car train to yourself and a whopping Niagara to order back and forth for as many run paths in as many places as you wished? That's precisely what the company photographer of the Central had this day. The weather wasn't just right. Oh, order them back for another session tomorrow. The boiler fronts on the Niagara's were a flat surface. These were called Selkirk front ends. Occasionally, when front ends were replaced on other classes of locomotives, such as the Hudson, a similar flat plate was used. Almost all Hudsons, whatever the class, had a distinctive contoured smoke box cover. These were hammered into a die by men using sledgehammers on the shop floor. Hudson was able to run 50% more service mileage than its predecessor. This meant fewer locomotives and crewmen, and a reduction in the number of engine changes between New York and Chicago. One J3 covered the entire distance where formerly changes were required at Buffalo, Cleveland, and Toledo. ran an average of 110,000 miles a year. Some J3 Hudsons averaged 16,000 miles a month, the equivalent of 18 trips between Harmon and Chicago. All told, the Central owned 275 Hudsons, more than any other railroad in America. In fact, 40% of all those ever produced.
street operations in Syracuse ended September 24, 1936. The Pacifics required 20 hours to haul the century from New York to Chicago. With the introduction of the J-1 in 1932, schedules were cut to 18 hours. After the tracks down the main street of Syracuse, which required 10 mile per hour running, were rerouted in 1936, the century schedule was dropped to 16 and a half hours. With the introduction of the J-3, another 30 minutes was sliced from the schedule. This meant that despite seven stops, the train averaged 59.9 miles an hour. When the Niagara's came in 1947, still another 30 minutes was cut from the schedule, and three additional stops were added. The average speed for the entire distance was 61.7 miles an hour. days it was estimated that building deterioration caused by railway smoke was costing ten dollars per person annually for the entire population of the country. On average the Hudson spread a ton of ash and unburnt coal over the countryside for each hour that it ran. An average of 173 pounds of coal were spread on each square foot of grate Yet the boiler efficiency was only 56% because so much coal went out the stack. It was almost impossible to run a Hudson out of steam. The J-3 was more powerful than a J-1, partly because live steam and exhaust pipes came closer to cylinder size and steam flow was freer.
Streamlining happened first on the New York Central. In 1934, the Central borrowed from the odd shovel-nosed appearance of the first or pioneer Zephyr of the Burlington and dropped an overturned bathtub shape on a Hudson. It's not exactly a winner from an aesthetic point of view. This was followed by a series of modified bathtubs a couple of years later for the famed Mercuries, the streamliners that ran between Detroit and Cleveland and Chicago. The shape was a big improvement over the first try, but it was still bloated. The shroud seemed to be too big for the locomotive underneath. The first real success was the Coxcomb Shroud by Henry Dreyfus. It was designed specifically for the Central's all-new pre-war 20th century limited. The Central designated standard smooth-sided Pullman passenger cars painted them a refined gray with a continuous silver and dark blue stripe, and Dreyfus matched his locomotive shroud to them. It was often called the most beautiful streamlining job done on a locomotive. The bullet-shaped nose of the boiler was allowed to protrude discreetly through a short skirt, the whole apple smooth and split at the center by a vertical fin, sometimes called a coxcomb. The centuries were introduced in June of 1938. The polished skull and disc drivers and gleaming side rides of their brand new J3 Hudsons flashing on a 16 hour schedule between New York and Chicago. An average of 59.9 miles an hour for 958 miles with the same engine and as much as 1,000 tons. This included seven intermediate stops which consumed 26 minutes. It is said that on May 11, 1893, on a descending grade of 15 feet to the mile west of Batavia, New York, engine 999 with the Empire State Express in tow was timed by a conductor's watch at 112 miles an hour for a single mile. The railroad made great fanfare about this. Plaques to this effect were installed on the engine itself and wherever it was placed on display. Although the railroad used the 112 mile an hour figure frequently in advertising, it never officially acknowledged the speed, nor did the official railway publications of the day. A speed of 102.8 miles an hour for a single mile on May 9 was recognized. It is significant that the latter speed came at the end of a 430 mile run from Grand Central Station in New York to Buffalo. It immediately followed a sustained speed of 86 miles an hour for five consecutive miles. At that time, it was most unusual for a single engine to run such a distance. Normal practice was to change engines at Albany and Syracuse. It would appear that this second run was orchestrated to publicize the Empire State Express and dazzle the public before the locomotive's display with train at the World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago during the summer of 1893. It was without doubt the greatest publicity stunt of the time. The post office issued a special two-color, two-cent stamp in honor of 999. Combined, these events and a billiard smooth roadbed helped the Central establish a dominance in the New York-Chicago passenger market that despite many challenges by the Pennsylvania was never threatened. The all-time record for steam engine speeds was made in England. In 1938, a Grusley Pacific, 
coming down a long 0.5% grade, reached 126 miles an hour for a few seconds. It then continued at 120 miles an hour for three more miles. 